Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be back at State of the Map US um, talking again about the OpenStreetMap Cartel project, um, which is a project I started um, a few years back. And I've had the pleasure of presenting before. But like most things in OpenStreetMap, time moves on, and the project also moves on. Um, so I'm going to run through some of the more recent developments um, with the project. But first, there's a lot of people who this is their first conference, and there's a lot of people who are also new to OpenStreetMap. So I'm going to run through exactly what OpenStreetMap Carto is. When you view the main page on OpenStreetMap.org, 90-something percent of the screen real estate is taken up by this map. To create the map, we need to take the raw OpenStreetMap data, filter it, decide what we want to show, decide at what zoom levels we want to show it on, choose which colors to use, what the icons should look like, which things need labeling, and all this. And all these decisions are stored um, in the OpenStreetMap Carto project. That's what OpenStreetMap Carto is. It's the list of rules to, that explain what we want to show on this map on the front page. And it's just this particular layer that we're talking about. There are five different map layers on the OpenStreetMap front page. Each one of them has their own equivalent project to decide um, what's shown. We're just talking about the standard layer, the so-called standard layer. Now, these rules and, and decisions are um, specified in a language called Carto CSS. And that's where the name comes from, OpenStreetMap Carto. The Carto, as well as kind of standing for cartography, it means specifically Carto CSS. And it's, uh, um, it's familiar for anybody who's ever designed web pages, um, who use cascading style sheets to um, decide what gets shown on a web page. We use the same kind of ideas. If you look closely at this uh, code, you can see certain things like how big the text should be, what color things are drawn in. The project as a whole is the collection of the Carto CSS files, a few other configuration files, um, icons, and so on. And it's stored in a project on GitHub. This is where we track the issues. People manage pull requests, which is the, the request to make changes. Um, and it's all, it's all coordinated here from GitHub. The URL, if you're interested, was on the first slide. It will be on the last slide as well. So don't worry about that. I want to start actually on the personal side of this rather than too much into the technology. And that's the team of people who are involved in, uh, in this project. It started with just me transferring um, the map style from an old system into this Carta CSS system. Um, but immediately that it became public, other people started helping out. And over the last year, we've had a, a few organizational changes, which has really um, exploded the, the ability of us to, to process changes. And it's really good. The first thing is that I'm no longer the dictator. I'm no longer the man in charge. Um, we actually have four people who all have equal permissions. Um, and, and we are the committers. We are the project managers um, for this. Matthias Matus, Paul Norman, who I've seen around today. I'm not sure if he's in the room at the moment, um, and myself. Uh, and so we, we have the authority to make any change to the, the map style directly. But we don't use it. We actually set it up so that um, if any of us want to make a change, someone else has to review that change before it goes in. It's a big, high-profile project. It's worth being cautious about making the changes and getting things right. So the four of us are the committers. We're also joined by 39 other contributors. And these are all people who have made changes to the map style in the last couple of years. Um, the names there are the, the top 10. Um, people, you can see three of them. I don't actually know what their names are. I haven't met half of these people at all. And of the people who I have met, it's generally at events like this, which is, is fantastic. Um, if Nebulon42, Polar Bearing, or Mr. Wojo are in the room, I'd love to find out who you are later on. <laughs> Um, and yeah, like I say, there's, there's lots of other people who have contributed. Even just the, the one change, it all goes in um, to making the project work. And talking about changes, we call the, the technical term for these changes are commits. as when we change a color or, or change some other attribute. Um, and these have been building over the years. The, the flurry at the left-hand end in 2012 was just me starting up. So there were lots of little changes um, all in quick succession. You can see, especially over the last year, 
things are stepping up where we're, we're doing up to around 80 or, or higher changes per month. And as well as all the changes, these are the changes to the code. We also have people helping us by commenting um, on issues and on, on the pull requests. This is a diagram of the 329 different people who have commented and therefore helped make this map style in one way or another. Each of these boxes represents one person. Uh, the size of the box is the number of comments. Um, so you can see, like, like you would expect, there's a few people who do a, a lot of commenting and there's, there's a large number of people who just make a handful of comments each. The yellow squares are the four committers. I'm actually the small box in amongst it because it's, it's working really well. The sharing the tasks between everybody is, is working really well. Um, and the green boxes are, are people who have not only commented, but made a specific change request, and those have been accepted. I'm hoping over the next year more and more of these um, boxes will be able to take people who clearly have an interest in helping or quite keen on commenting and get them to the point where they're comfortable proposing changes to. So, like I say, the project has been going for a couple of years, or about three years now. Um, I want to talk about what's changed recently give you some of the highlights. And it has to be highlights because there were 650 different changes last year and, well, I'm, I'm not gonna go through them all. So I picked up three big changes that I think people might even have noticed themselves. The first one is um, advanced labels for, for land use areas. So on this screen we have a large park on the top left called Brockwell Park. Some smaller parks, including the Hernhill Villadrome, uh, down towards the bottom in the center, there's some um, allotments. And each of these features is a different size. And if you look carefully, the labels are different sizes as well. They're based on how much of the screen uh, space is taken up. So as you zoom in and out, the labels get bigger the closer you get to, to a large feature. Um, and they're all color coded now as well. 12 months ago, they were all just all the same size in black in the middle. Um, so the, to me, this is a, a, a big improvement. It's not necessarily something that you would spot straight away. Um, and the cartography isn't supposed to be like that. It's just supposed to be something that, that works, that doesn't jar, um, that looks, looks good. Talking about things that don't jar, um, this slide was, was hard to get right on, on these projectors, but we got close. Um, what, what I'm discussing here is the, the color of the buildings, which used to be a strong purple color. I'm not entirely sure why, but it would dominate the entire map um, in built up areas like New York City or like here in London. And we wanted to change the color of the buildings so that they're less obvious um, or less, less eye catching um, and let you see more of the rest of the map. So now you can actually see where the roads go and the, the other features on the map. Changing the color of the buildings meant that we had to do a lot of analysis on all the other colors, the land use colors, what color residential areas and things like that were, in order that they were also sufficiently eye-catching or sufficiently um, in the background. And Paul Norman did a lot of good work um, with some color theory in order to, to make this work together. Um, it's just a, the start of a process because there are a uh, hundred other features all need their, their colors examined and balanced to stop sticking out. Um, and the third of the big changes that we've made is to the icons. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes to convert all of our icons from raster PNG images into vector SVGs. Um, at the same time, we've redesigned the icons uh, to be you know, just a, a little bit crisper, a little bit easier to see, less blurry. Um, but this is kind of foundation work for things that are going to happen in the future involving high DPI maps um, and allowing us to change the sizes and, and the clarity of images much more. I can't overstate how much effort has gone into changing dozens and dozens of icons working uh, from scratch. It's been a great project um, and it, it, largely driven by non-committers, this one as well, Nebulon42 and Daniel Koch are the, the two main people who have been uh, redesigning these icons. Of course, it's not all fun and games. There's a few challenges that we, we need to deal with. And one of the biggest challenges is a kind of like high level thing. Most map cartography is done by a small, maybe one or two individual people who have an idea, have a strong design background, and then make all the changes. 
And it has never been done where a large number of people have tried to collaboratively design a map and where it turns out well. And I'm not sure we're there yet, but it's certainly a, a challenge that I'm, I'm still working on. But specifically, the map that we have has two major purposes. The first one is what you see here. This is what the default view of OpenStreetMap looks like. Now, when you go to OpenStreetMap again, you'll see where you were last looking at. But this is the default. So if you've never been to OpenStreetMap before, this is what we show them. And as I said earlier, it takes up more than 90% of the screen space. So this has a big impact on people's first impressions of the project. And I'm not entirely sure this is the world's best map to show, the, the world's best first impression. So certainly something that I'm still focused on is trying to improve that, um, just the, the beauty of the map, or at least, the, you know, the, hide some of the, the technical details. But that often runs in conflict with the other main purpose of the map, which is it's the main route for mapper feedback. We update it every minute. People make changes. They want to see their changes. They add new features. They want to see those features. They add a new attribute to a shop. They want to see the specific things. We've even had requests for the type of public toilet to reflect whether it's a sit toilet or a pit toilet or whether the pit toilet has a bench on it. So these are the kind of levels of detail the mappers are interested in, but perhaps are a bit overwhelming. And when I say overwhelming, I mean things like this. This is, this is what a well-mapped town looks like in OpenStreetMap at the moment. And it's, it's certainly not the clearest map. It, it would be hard to find a particular street or figure out what the best way to walk from one side of the town to the other. Even though it's massively dominated by shops, it's still kind of, it's hard to see where all the jewelry shops are in amongst it. So I'm not really sure it's um, achieving any purpose other than to say, hey, there's lots of data here. So those are the two main requirements of the map. And it still remains to be seen whether it's possible to make a map that is both good for um, giving people an overview of OpenStreetMap and also giving mappers the detail that they want. And mappers do want a lot of detail. And these discussions can go on for a while. So this is a screenshot of one of the discussions we had on redesigning the library book, uh, the library icon. You can see it went on for a while. This is not the longest conversation that we've had on one of these topics, but this is the longest one that Firefox can take a full screenshot of before it runs out of memory. So this is 30 odd comments and the 115 comments, I need a better laptop, I, I can't take a picture of it. Um, but the worrying thing about this is it starts off with the, our icon designer saying, hey, I've come up with some new icons for a library. We have all these discussions, everybody has their feedback, feedback is good. You know, we improve it. And at the end, he gives up. And he says, we're going in circles. We're getting nowhere. And he just closes his request and moves on. And that's a downside. In fact, the amount of comments that we have to deal with can be seen as a downside. There were 7,800 comments in the last 12 months on our repo. And I read every one of them. And all the other maintainers read every one of them. But we need to strike a balance between what are useful comments and what are just people having a chat, basically. Um, are there more appropriate venues for people to go and, and discuss these things other than on the issue tracker? So I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see everybody, call, uh, everybody joining in. I do value the 329 people who have commented, but I think we're reaching the limit of, of what we can manage. I wouldn't be able to read 40,000 comments a month, for example, unless I made this a full-time job. What things can I see on the, on the future of the OpenStream App Carter project? The first one is a rendering of roads. It's been the same since we started the project, more or less. We use the same colors, more or less. We use the same road hierarchy, um, which is very kind of developed nation orientated on what do we think a motorway looks like? What do we think a primary road looks like? And that line of thinking doesn't apply everywhere in the world. One of the biggest missing features is around um, the surfaces of roads. It makes a big difference in much, most parts of the world what surface type there are, and we show no indication on that at all. It's a complicated topic. It's one of these topics that was too big for me to take a screenshot of. But we are in a really strong position because one of our maintainers is a candidate for the Google Summer of Code this summer, and right now is working on his summer project, which is redesigning and re-implementing the road presentation in the default OpenStreetMap map style. 
Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. He knows what he's doing, um, and we're going to vastly improve the way we, we draw roads with it. The second thing is the map key. If you look on OpenStreetMap and you press the map key button, you get to see what everything on the map means. This key was last substantially updated in 2009, that's six years ago. Um, and we're making 650 changes a year at the moment, and we're not updating the map key. So <laughs> we, need to, we need to sort that out. Um, I, I have a plan, and the, um, I've written a piece of software already called Mapnik Legendary. Um, which is a piece of software that takes Mapnik style sheets and generates legend files from it. So we'll be able to automatically update these um, legend files. Um, I use it already for five other projects, but it needs more development in order to be able to handle the complexity of the main OpenStreetMap style sheet. Um, and I'll be working on that. The hack, weekend, or the hack day on Monday has been mentioned a few times. If you're interested in this kind of thing, come and talk to me. We also have here on display two completely unrelated changes, except that both of them require upgrades to the software that we use to generate the map. On the left-hand side is some font rendering. Um, I'm not 100% sure how easy it is to see the purple text on the map. If you look carefully at the, the big, bold version and one on the map itself, the characters are in the wrong order. They're not in the right place. This is a problem with the OpenStreetMap main map layer is that outside of Latin text, we mess up lots of the text at the moment. Um, and that's not great for an international project. On the right hand side, you see some of the extra information that we currently we, we can't use to improve the, the map. Like, for example, um, whether it's wheelchair accessible, what type of um, fast food restaurant we're talking about. These are just tags that we don't have in our database and we can't um, use them. But of course we have upcoming solutions for both of those. The first one is um, Mapnik 3, which is due for release any day now, TM, um, which has huge improvements in the text rendering by using a library called HarfBuzz. It's designed to vastly improve the internationalized text. And for anybody who's involved in, in any projects around the world, you'll see a noticeable improvement in the quality of text rendering. Um, the database reload, we're going to reload it with a, a system called HStore, which allows us to access all the OpenStreetMap tags. So if there's any useful tag that we can um, um, employ to, to improve the rendering, we'll have access to that. Um, we're looking at doing this over the next couple of months, but we haven't nailed down the exact dates yet. And then finally, the big question that everybody always asks me is, what about vector tiles? And this isn't the, the place to start getting into deep discussions about what vector tiles are. Um, they offer us a few solutions, uh, or a few advantages um, in that we will be able to return map images faster when people are looking at unusual parts of the world. Um, but also, it provides an option for us to have different map outputs without vastly increasing the amount of servers that we need in order to give those outputs. And so if the grand plan to make the all singing, all dancing map turns out not to be possible, and we need to split our first impressions map from our mapper's information map, this could be a way of, of doing it. If you're interested in vector tiles, there are plenty of other discussions at this conference and plenty of videos from previous conferences explaining um, more about the, the system. I mentioned the workshop. I'll mention it again. Uh, <laughs> we are on, during the hack day on Monday, just after lunch, I'm running a workshop called the State of the Style Sheets, which is for all you people now who are going to join our merry band of contributors. That's, that's all you guys. Um, I'm running a workshop on Monday that gives you the exact details of how to get started, how to make changes, how to get these map style sheets working on your own laptop so that you can get involved um, in helping. And that's it. Thanks very much. We have time for questions, if anybody has one. Uh, the little microphone button is right beside the microphone in front of you. At the back. That's it. So at what point do you decide that there's just too much stuff to put on the map? So 
that was that was taken care of years ago. There is definitely too much stuff in OpenStreetMap to put on the map. That's that's not a problem. The the difficulty, and it's still a, a topic of eternal debate, is to um, figure out what's appropriate to put on this map style. Now, in some cases, it's, it's easy because we have alternative map styles. So most cycling information, for example, it's fine. It appears on open cycle map. It, it doesn't need to go onto the main layer. But where we struggle with most is when we have people who are very interested in a particular topic, such as pit latrines. Um, and they don't have an existing map to show that information. So they're out working somewhere. They have lots of volunteers. They're putting the map information into OpenStreetMap, and it's not coming back out anywhere. And that's a, a large amount of pressure on this project to show these features. I think it's still an open question as to, how, as, as to where to draw that line. I get asked to draw that line all the time. That's, that's basically what I now do as a maintainer, is make those tough decisions. Um, if Russ Nelson is in the room, then he'll explain what it's like to feel like to be on the wrong side of that decision because his project on abandoned railways is no longer shown on the map style. So if anybody has any suggestions, if anybody has a nice little rule of thumb or a statement that says, this is how you figure out what's appropriate to put on the main layer, this is how you figure out what's not appropriate, please tell me. I would love to hear it. <laughs> Wasn't bright, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. Cons consider, sorry. Have you considered uh, allowing the users to create their own custom style sheets? Okay, sorry, I forgot to repeat the questions because they don't go out over the, the streaming. So the question here is, um, have you considered allowing users to create their own custom style sheets? Yeah. They, that's always a possibility. Anybody can create their own custom style sheets. Any company can do it. Um, the question uh, or the difficulty is what hardware do you then run it on? Because not everybody has access or the ability to just take um, raw OpenStreetMap data and run a worldwide map server. The OpenStreetMap Foundation has taken the um, decision not to offer that because it would just cost so much money at the moment. So uh, we're just sticking to one map style. Like I say, with this vector tiles, that could open possibilities to make it at least easier and most importantly cheaper um, to host custom map styles. But you can see that companies such as Mapbox build an entire organization and have 100 staff working on serving custom maps. I'm not sure that the foundation has that capacity. Any questions? At the front here. How's it going? So I, uh I did a lot of workshops with GeoStack stuff, and I was all, I would always, with tiles, I would always end up with your project as the example of like how to do this, or how you know like how a really major project gets done. And speaking of Mapbox, so Tile Mill isn't really supported anymore. I don't know if anybody's picked up that challenge, and I'm just curious how that's affecting your work or how you see. I mean, that dovetails with vector tiles to some extent, but it's sort of a separate question too. Yeah. So the the question is. Um Tile Mill, which is a project we use, um, or a lot of people use to, to design these, is no longer supported by Mapbox, and, and they've moved on to, to other topics. Um, and generally, where do we go from here? I talk about this more during the, the workshop. There is an alternative um, map design software called Cosmetic now, which is run by a community member, um, and I think has a better long-term future than, than Tile Mill. I'm not even 100% convinced how long Mapbox Studio will be supported for as they move into other um, areas of rendering like the um, GL, Map the, the um, OpenGL-based rendering. Um, so it's, a, it's an open question. I do know that you don't need to use a, a particular piece of software to help design this. Um, different members of the team use different pieces of software. Um, so I hope it will continue like that. We've got time for one more question, if there is one. Right at the very back. Is this working? Uh, I, you mentioned like with the purple buildings, like they, they were like clashing with the visual hierarchy of stuff. And I just kind of wonder if there's been any consideration or efforts to do some kind of like contextual styling to where like the styles themselves can respond to the like geographic context of what you're currently looking at or something like that. That's a great question. So the question is, um, 
especially around colors, but I'm going to expand the answer slightly and say on, on most features, is the way for a map to adapt to the, the context, the amount of data in that area. So in really crowded areas for it to self-adjust. Um, that's still like a research grade thing to be able to um, make this in a fully automated, fully worldwide and minutely updatable system in order to adjust the, the um, contrast of the colors or, or how punchy they are based on how many other things there are around um, the area. Um, the one thing I will caution against with this particular project is we try and keep it fairly simple between you put stuff in OpenStreetMap and it shows up on the map because um, that's what mappers expect. So the big, the big difficulty with the shops is we would like it if there's only one shop to show that shop, if there's 100 shops not to show each one of them, but wait until you zoom in further. That makes it very confusing for the 100,000 mappers who are putting in shops because in some places they show up and in some places they don't. They don't understand how the system works. They think they're making a mistake. They get worried. It's all unnecessary. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting topic, but I'm not sure how applicable it is to our map styles. We're out of time now. Thanks very much for coming. I look forward to seeing some more of you at the hack day working on this. Thank you.